Hello, everyone. Welcome to the afternoon of TechCon Day 1. I'm Cosmo Shalaki. I'm your host for Observability and DevOps Track. Hopefully, you enjoyed our session this morning and Mark Randolph's uh, session just that you just maybe just came from. Um, so great to be learning along with all of you guys today. And next up, we have Yanni, and we're going to talk about database and DevOps around databases, which is exciting to say the least. Um, we want to make this interactive. So if you have any questions, don't forget to raise your hand, enter any comments, questions in the chat or QA sessions. Um, and without further delay, I, I'm really excited to bring in our business partner, TV Maestro, uh, with Yaniv. And so over to you. Hi, Cosmo. Good morning. Uh, hello, everybody. A pleasure being here today with you. Uh, so in the next uh, uh, hour, uh, I would like to I'll tell you a bit about my experience, my uh, understanding of, of this market, what I see and hear and learn from, from many interactions, and use the time to provide you with some uh, interesting uh, nuggets of information and also tell you a bit about what we do and how it might uh, help you. So before actually diving into to the practical stuff, uh, we are talking about DevOps and observability. So I took a snippet from, from Gartner about like what is observability and how does that relate to what we're talking about? So really, I think this quote says it all. Uh, we're talking about many organization uh, having a lot of different databases, um, dealing with a lot of configurations, a lot of environments. So the more agile, the more DevOps we're, uh, we're becoming, uh, there's more stuff to deal with and, and higher frequency. And, and of course, uh, we can't, uh, let this create any kind of uh, risk or downtime. So as Gartner sees that, it's all about being able to create a holistic uh, uh, method that, that works, that can create uh, uh, these pipelines for the database. And what I would like to start with is, is some uh, uh, nuggets of information of, uh, from a, a, a survey that we run um, like uh, a year or so ago. And, and I think the, the results are, are very interesting. So one of the things that we learned is that everybody, it doesn't matter if you're small or big, everybody's uh, planning to move faster. Uh, of course, you're coming from, from uh, agile processes. Uh, nobody, well, there's still some working with, with uh, waterfall processes, but everybody's trying to be more efficient, to crank out more releases, to be better in delivering uh, application to, to the customers, so uh, being better from time to market perspective. So we're implementing uh, Agile, we're implementing CI, CD, uh, this kind of automation and that kind of automation, hopefully also DevOps practices. So we're moving faster, okay? So that's clear, and, and the expectation is to move faster yet uh, more than that. But in this market, we have great solutions. We have Urban Code, we have GitLab, we have a lot of uh, Jenkins and, and, and all of the, a lot of uh, uh, DevOps solutions that together help us build that, that pipeline, that uh, efficient process. But most of them are dealing with the application side of things. So it's very clear how to create a CI process for your application, for your Java or .NET or whatever it might be. But what is a CI for the database? How do we do that? Uh, is, do we even have solutions to deal with the database? It's not that clear. So what we actually see uh, with like people, prospects, customers who we talk to is that uh, uh, they gain some maturity in the application side of things, create good processes, create automation, and then figure out, okay, we have part of our uh, uh, environment fully automated or greatly automated uh, with the application side of things, but the database is still manual. Uh, from completely manual to semi-automated to maybe not that uh, a lot of uh, customers that do gain the ability to automate things well. So there's a gap, okay? And and this gap is, is what I want to focus about uh, uh, in this uh, session. So first of all, one of the bigger problem is that we tend to have silos, okay? If we go back 10 years, 15 years, like, Database changes were all done by your DBA. If the uh, developer needs anything, he would ask the DBA. The DBA would, it, would do it, would initiate the, 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 the change, would deploy it to, to pre-production, production, etc., and would provide the, 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 the update to the developer. 
So uh, just think about this in, in relation to everything that we talked about, like running faster, being agile, uh, doing CI, CD, automation, cranking out more releases quicker. So we're talking about high frequency. We're talking about uh, a lot of releases, maybe smaller one for the safety of the release. And we're talking about moving through uh, a bottleneck, okay? A siloed bottleneck. So of course, this is something that would create uh, a challenge. So DBAs, even though you're trying to, to ask them, you know, we need to run faster, we need to have more responsibility uh, and, and small changes, more exact ones, they tend to invest more and more time dealing with these deliveries. So uh, uh, this is actually a, a survey that we, we ran several times. So if you can see uh, on the right side, uh, DBAs were almost doubling the amount of time they're investing in, del they're, uh, uh, investing in, in, in delivering database changes. So it becomes a challenge because, of course, it's, it's the expense of other things. You don't have time for code review. You don't have time to deal with security. You don't have time to deal with other things. So we have a challenge here, okay? Bottleneck pushing us to do stuff. We don't have to do stuff, other stuff that we maybe should do. And on top of that, we have issues and problems and challenges that are unique for the database. And that means things like configuration drift. The database is inherently different than, than the application. Okay, we have persistent data. We can't just compile the database and copy it from one environment to the other like we do for application code. Uh, that would definitely make things uh, easier, but the database needs to be uh, uh, altered. The database has persistent data, persistent configuration. Configuration is part of every environment that we have, so we have to push the configuration and, and change it in an inc incremental way. And one of the things, one of the problems, and, and the one creating most of the challenges is, for example, configuration drift. The database is slightly different from a configuration perspective in different environments, which contribute to be one of the biggest uh, challenges for, you know, uh, shipping out releases and, and doing that uh, safely and reliably. So uh, we have different processes, different concepts, technology gaps. We have definitely higher risk when we talk about the database. You know, if you break the database, it's harder to fix and sometimes impossible, uh, like in comparison to having something uh, on the code side of things. If you have like the executable saved in, in, in uh, an artifactory or, or, or this repository or another, it's very easy to go back a version to, to, to roll things out again. But when you talk about the database, you have to be more precise because the cost of of an issue or the cost of risk is higher. Uh, on, on top of this, we have bottlenecks. We have uh, uh, processes of moving on-prem to cloud. So we have a lot of complex uh, uh, challenges and, and unique, unique uh, uh, issues to deal with. And we need to come up with a process that would help us support all of this in a good and, 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 and well-managed way. So how do we do that? First of all, we are not inventing any wheel. We need to follow uh, proving processes. Part of it is, is making sure that we work according to DevOps best practices, um, meaning creating repeatable releases, uh, better communication between uh, contributors. Uh, we need to balance workload. Okay, we talked about, I talked about, uh, uh, having uh, bottlenecks around database people. Uh, maybe if we shift some of the loads to uh, 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 application contributor developers or application DBAs that would even up uh, uh, the, the this challenge. Okay, so we need to see how we do this safely because we don't want anybody to be able to do anything. Again, because we said the risk is high, so we need to think about how to, how to do that in in a safe way. Uh, we need to align uh, uh, the way organizations are managing risk. So, you know, if we have uh, a higher risk of of, of uh, or higher, uh, let's call it not risk, but a higher uh, potential damage from from uh, manifesting a, a, a risk, then we want to be careful. So if a developer would uh, try to drop a table, we definitely don't want to do that and try to fix it because we want we want to prevent it. So we need to come up with some kind of a policy, how to manage who can do what, who's authorized uh, to do what action and, and, and how to uh, introduce testing in a way 
that would prevent us from trying to do something and then going back and trying to fix it. So the best way uh, to solve a problem is not to create it in the first place. Uh, usually, no, n not, not so much lately because people are starting to understand that. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, the conversation I'm having with customers, they're, they're asking, about, asking me about how, how do we do a rollback? Well, definitely, you know, we can help with that, but the best thing uh, uh, to to deal with a, a rollback is not to need it in the first place. To have a tested process that when you actually ship it to production, it's uh, uh, it's it was tested well in, in development, in QA, in, in UAT, in pre-production and production. And while you get to, to production, it's there, there's no reason to need to, to, to roll back. You're not testing it for the first time. You're not seeing problems for the first time, not performance and not anything else. So the goal is to have a, a, a repeatable process that would lower the risk for uh, challenges, that would manage the way uh, you introduce changes, that would uh, help you document everything that's happening and would uh, help you accelerate end-to-end uh, -end process without introducing uh, risks. So. Uh, essentially, this is what I want to talk, talk to you about today and the demo I want to uh, provide to you. Um, and, and now shifting to, to actually how we can do things uh, with the Umastro. So Umastro is focusing on four uh, areas of, of value. Uh, I would go through this not essentially in, in, in an importance uh, uh, order, but maybe more in a kind of a a day-to-day -day process. So essentially, when you create a change, you need to manage the way uh, uh, you introduce it. Maybe a developer would, would need to have to deal with a task and, and, and you want to document this in your GitLab or, or, or other source control. And then you need to have some kind of a CI. What is even a CI for a database and a CD? So to deploy changes and how to manage this from a, uh, uh, an auditing perspective and a security perspective. And what I'm going to do now is go through all of these uh, uh, stages and uh, actually show you uh, how the master can help you uh, with these uh, value points. So with that, let me share my uh, VM here. Just a second. some reason it's not letting me share it just a minute mm -hmm. not this one sorry about that I'll try to resolve this quickly There it is. Not sure why it didn't let me share it before, but uh, you should be seeing it coming up. Yes, uh, okay, perfect. So, um, there it is. So, uh, uh, what is DB Master? As I said, DB Master is a DevSecOps uh, a solution for the database. And what I would like to show you today is like a day in a life, uh, uh, over, overviewing these four value points, uh, uh, working and, and assisting uh, collaborative development with the database, uh, achieving CI, doing CD, and managing everything from a security and uh, compliance perspective. So uh, the US is, uh, first of all, uh, a multi-database uh, solution supporting like many databases, uh, MS SQL, Oracle, DB2, Mongo, Snowflake, Postgres, MySQL, uh, Redshift, RDSs, Auroras, and, 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 and many others. Each one of the boxes you see here is essentially a project. That means that you may have uh, like a, a smaller project, maybe with just uh, an integration environment, QA and production, or maybe a bigger one with like uh, also several UATs and pre-production and production. So it doesn't really matter uh, how your project looks like. Uh, you can create this mapping. Now, this is a pipeline, but a passive one, meaning everything that you would do from an orchestration perspective would be managed through 
uh, uh, your existing orchestrator. May this be uh, uh, Jenkins or or GitLab or uh, Urban Code or Azure DevOps or whatever it might be. Uh, Investor could integrate with this. And what I would show you today is uh, such integration. I would also like touch uh, some some ticketing systems. I know a lot of people are using are using Jira. So let's say that for this uh, for the sake of this demo. I'm now wearing my uh, developer hat, and my team leader gave me uh, a task uh, uh, to deal with this Jira ticket. So um, I'm going to take this uh, ticket and uh, take it to my list. Okay. So let's say that this ticket is actually something that, that I need to introduce some data, database changes. I, I need to update my application. I need to uh, maybe introduce a new table, change the procedure, etc. So for the sake of that, I would just go to my database. I may be working on a shared database, like with the whole of my team. I may be working on a, a sandbox database on my local laptop, you know, maybe working from home. So let's say that in this case, I would uh, create a new table, and that table would be, uh, just for the sake of, of this conference, uh, tech. So let's copy it and use it later on. So I created a, uh, a new uh, column with the table in the same same name. Good. So there's a new table. And I would also uh, maybe change a procedure. So let's see. I have a procedure here that I need to modify. Um, this is not Boeing. This is the column. Okay, so I did some changes. I executed my uh, uh, procedures now. I'm uh, testing my application locally. And when I'm done, all I need to do is go to the investor source control, which is what you see here, and ask it to uh, tell me what's new. Okay, so what the investor is going to do, it's actually uh, going to go to my uh, Git repo. So this may be uh, uh, a GitLab uh, uh, thing, a, a local Git. Here's I have I have actually both. Okay, so this is my latest changes, and it's gonna look at the repo. It's gonna look at the database. It's gonna understand what's new, and it's gonna tell me. Listen, there's some changes. Okay, so uh, it used to be, you have a, a procedure here. It used to be Boeing. It's now TechCon. Perfect. I want this change, and there's also a new table. I want this as well. And let's say that this is a demo for TechCon. And I'm going to commit. Now, obviously, uh, for anybody working with, with like uh, application code, this is the way you work. This is how you introduce changes. But this, what the US enables you, is to manage the database in the same rate. So I can review all my changes. What I need, I can just push the changes. And that means that everything is now part of my uh, repo. OK, so I'll refresh that repo. Here's TechCon. I'll zoom in and drill in. And here's uh, the change. It was Boeing. Now it's TechCon. This is saved in my repo. This is part of the application repo. This is like I have everything in, in one place. So the database becomes something that you can manage at the same rate. Now, I may, may be working on my own uh, uh, copy. But when I push the changes, this was user 1. User 2 may say, OK, so what is new? Uh, maybe I need to uh, I need to work on a new feature, and I want to make sure that I have all the latest changes. So he would pull changes, just like you do for uh, uh, your uh, application changes. And of course, uh, he would be able to see that uh, he has Boeing, but here it's a TechCon. Perfect. I want this. There's also a new table. I want this as well. Please give me the code to implement this to merge this to my local. Uh, database. Now, I did say merge happening behind the scenes is that DMS3 is just taking changes and implementing them. DMS3 is merging changes. So if I have, uh, you know, people doing the uh, development in parallel, then they may have conflicting changes and, and of course get supported and, and the database is not. So what we need to do is uh, help generate that merge. And what DMS3 does is exactly this. So for example, here I have uh, my my baseline and, and merge area and and one team has uh, created some changes so there they created this uh, comment and I want this and the other team has created a, a change here and I want that as well and I want to fix like the 
uh, join to the, the merge code and, and done. Okay, and this works also for metadata. So if I have uh, information, lookup table uh, that, that I need to, to keep in my Git, that would be saved as well. So I can see the changes in metadata, the changes in uh, how uh, my parameters maybe are changing because if, if it's not transactional data, maybe, maybe there's a value in, in managing this. So for example, here, uh, it used to be USD and now it's USD with the dollar sign. So I want this and there's also a Bitcoin. So I want that and that's it. I have a merge code. When this is done, what I'm getting is the code to implement in the database. So either to create that new release or to merge that change into uh, my local database. So in this case, it created the table. I'm jumping back to, to user two. It's created the table and because uh, a procedure was already created, it says alter because it knows it's there. It doesn't try to create it. it it's, it's actually merging change. So all I need to do is just apply change or take that script and say, I want to populate this uh, uh, as the next release. So just going back to the second team. So this was team one or my local uh, uh, sandbox and here's user two. And if I'm going to his table, I should have now TechCon here, which is perfect. I just pulled it and, and, and executed. If I'm going to the procedures and looking at that other procedure, I would have TechCon as well. So what we saw here is actually how we streamline all the database changes into the repo, how that repo becomes a uh, uh, like a standardized repo for the database, how teams can pull and push changes. And of course, how uh, the answer would help you generate uh, code for that release. Now, I did say generate code, but you don't have to work like this. So maybe you have a perfect process and you create your code differently, or maybe you use different tools to create code. It doesn't really matter, but at the end of the day, you have a piece of code. Maybe you hand coded it, maybe someone contributed it, uh, maybe uh, maybe uh, I don't know, someone sent it over to you and and, and now uh, you, you just need to, to, to implement this. So um, wherever, whatever your source of change is, you could put it in Git, put it in a folder, put it in an email that would merge into something, it, it doesn't really matter. Any source of change would, would, would work, but at the end of the day, you have a potential release. And that potential release now needs to go through a CI, CD uh, a compliant process. So how do we do that? Uh, in this case, what the USO lets you do is, of course, obviously it's DevOps, so you can fine tune your process and, and, and tweak it. I'm gonna show this uh, from two angles. One is, uh, uh, like a, a ticket-based Jira Jenkins perspective, and then the other one would be uh, uh, a GitHub, a GitLab, uh, sorry, uh, uh, process. So, uh, as a developer, I completed this task. I, I think I'm done. Okay, so I'm gonna just pull this, and I'm saying this is ready for approval. And my team leader would say, okay, uh, I need to approve some some things. But what's happening now behind the scenes? Just the fact that I did that status change from it's in progress to it's done, something happened in the background. And, and what I did here uh, is triggered a CI process. Now, I did mention CI for the database a couple of times. What is CI for the database? So first of all, uh, I'm showing this uh, from a Jenkins Jira perspective and also from a, a, a GitLab uh, um, pipeline. So here's also the pipeline. It's very simple. Just this example is, is, is a single page. And what we have is the pipeline that would essentially uh, uh, compile the app, uh, pull the information from the database, uh, test it uh, to make sure that, that it, it goes through the CI, release it, uh, uh, release it to another environment and, and do a, a whole wrap up. So behind the scenes, what's happening is that actually Dean Maestro would do uh, tests on whatever code was uh, suggested. So as a developer, I pushed some changes, okay? But uh, they may be good changes, and they may be, in, let's say, less than optimal changes. In this case here, what I did is I tried uh, uh, to do some cleanup on my local machine, and I dropped some tables, and somehow one of the drop tables uh, remained in, in, in my, uh, 
planned release and, and planned uh, script to, to go forward. And what Emasso does as, as a first step is static code analysis. It actually looks at the code that was provided and run this through organizational policy. And in this case, one of the examples I, I, I usually provide is, you know, the risk of, of doing something that, that is hard to reverse. And, and of course, dropping a table by mistake, which you didn't intend, uh, is, is one of the like more painful ones, okay? So what Dimasso says here is that uh, policy was violated and uh, there's data loss risk because you try to drop a table and drop table is not allowed. Uh, dropping a table is just one of, like, we have more than 100 out-of-the-box policies. You can create your own, but essentially things like coding standards. You know, don't create a table without an index. Don't use Valkar Max. Don't do this alter. Don't execute immediate because that can be misused in runtime. Data loss risk. Don't drop a table, drop a, a column, truncate or purge the data. Naming conventions. In my project, every new table needs to start with this prefix. Uh, PII, performance security. Uh, by mistake, I grunted all, okay? And and I did grunt all because I didn't want to mess with, with like, uh, permissions on, on my low environments, but this is something that cannot be deployed to production. Policies which catch that. So, essentially, the goal here is to provide uh, uh, feedback to the developer as soon as he says he's done. So, the developer, me in this case, uh, wanted to to be done with the changes and 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 Dimaso could trigger something that would push that ticket back to his uh, 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 work in progress because it's not done. Of course, with the, the like the feedback uh, of exactly what is uh, done. So we see that from uh, uh, the the GitHub perspective, uh, we saw the different policies, but that was just the first layer, the first layer of a CI process. So the goal of CI is to make sure that we have a uh, shorter feedback loop. So instead of getting this, uh, no, you can't do this grunt or you, you're trying to do something that we don't do here, instead of getting this in two weeks, two months, I am getting this seconds after I like, committed my code or, or, or tried to, to, to say it's, it's ready. And this is important because this is saving a lot of uh, uh, time and of course the cost of rework, but that was just the first level. The second level, is actually being able to dry run that code. So as part of the CI, the MSO would spin up a temporary database and actually test for real the, all the pending changes. And I'm saying all the pending changes because I might have maybe a syntax error. I like, uh, forgot the E of the create table. Okay, so that's that's important because the MSO is preventing me from doing a mistake from even trying to do that as part of the release. It's actually done again seconds after I submitted the code. But DMSO is actually uh, dry running all the pending changes. So I might write perfect code and my colleague may write perfect code, but together we may conflict. And because we're actually catching this on the database level, nothing can, can, can be missed. It's not like we're trying to analyze what would happen if we're actually dry running it for real on a temporary database that we spin up with the correct version, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the dry run. Again, any challenge, any problem, we push it back to the developer. Uh, all of this information is always available. This is the, the, the master perspective of, of, of these changes. So here's the policy. Here's the uh, uh, the problem with uh, uh, the, the, the create. Because we actually run it, you could actually see all the feedback from the server, we, we catch this, we document this, and now as a developer, I fix my code and, and, and it may be better or perfect. Now, back to, uh, again, changing my hat to the team leader, I may look at the pending changes ready for approval saying, okay, that was, I see that that failed, it's already uh, in work again, but this one, this one went fine through the checks. I know that it's working according to company policy. I know that it's working well. I may be able to start pushing this forward. Um, I may decide to do an additional uh, code review or not based on the importance of what's, what's being done here, but that could be even automatically if, if, if I, I think that it's uh, relevant. And uh, uh, my role would be just to say, yes, I, I approve this as a team leader, this feature is 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 ready. 
do what you need to do with it and, and, and release it at, at the time that you see fit. Now, this could trigger a CD process, maybe uh, like automating everything without gateways, like if it's going through the CI, go immediately to release or be pending there for somebody that says, uh, okay, I need to release this. And releasing this would be as simple as we saw uh, before. So I may have uh, JIRA2 saying, yes, let's, let's deploy this. All I did is just pull this to the QA column. Again, this is my pipeline and my little changes. Uh, but essentially what this just did, I'll wait for Jenkins to fire. Whoops. Yep, yep. I'll wait for Jenkins to fire up again. I see it started running. Let's wait for the second or so. There, it's running. So uh, my uh, process now is starting to uh, deploy changes. So from a DB master perspective, this is the pipeline that I'm currently working in. So I, I chose to promote Jira 2. Uh, and if I'm looking at the pipeline, uh, it's still Jira 1. So what I uh, uh, created in the automation process is to have this uh, pod update uh, two environments. Okay, so let me push this uh, a bit further. We'll get back to it and, 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 and see what's happening. So what's actually happening behind the scenes now is that DMaster would actually uh, uh, run the changes, okay, because I actually de decided to deploy it. Of course, we can see the full history in GitLab uh, as well as in the Maestro. And while it's uh, like properly deployed, we would get uh, to keep all of this feedback. You would, of course, uh, completely uh, uh, automate the process and the feedbacks and, and, and save everything. But again, behind the scenes, additional things are happening when we're actually running the deployment or the CD process. Uh, and, and I want to show you uh, more about this. So what the Maestro can do and what it would do for you is actually create an impact analysis for the changes. So it's going to do a couple of things. Let me open up another uh, uh, environment here, put it here. I want to show you uh, uh, an interesting thing. So uh, before every release, the master would keep a baseline configuration of how the database is looking before you do the release, and then another one after the release. These baselines are going to then be used uh, in conjunction with uh, the release itself. So when you actually have something being changed, so let's say uh, uh, here, this uh, script, uh, it says alter table, demo table, okay? DMSO is analyzing the affected object. DMSO knows that demo table is about to change. And it knows how the database should look like before that change and after that change. So what it can do, it can actually create a safety net. Before we do the release, we want to make sure that uh, the database has what we think it, it should have. So the goal is to, uh, if, if you uh, remember my slide about uh, repeatability, to make sure that we have the same process released again and again and again. How, how do we do this? We're going to do uh, the release of that uh, package. There it is of this code that, that's doing whatever it needs to be doing. But we will also check the configuration before and after the release. And this, gonna, this is going to put us in a position to know if something is going to succeed or potentially introduce a risk before we do anything. So it can be done as explicitly or implicitly. So implicitly, if you just say, please release to the next environment, it's going to do this test. We call this pre-check uh, or, or pre-validation. And we could actually trigger a validation. And, and, and the best case scenario here, just for this uh, uh, demo, is saying I have a release to production over the weekend. I want to make sure that this release is going to go well. And what I triggered is uh, a validation of production and, and making sure it's, it's uh, like up to date with its like latest 3.1. And actually, you can see this uh, orange rectangle saying uh, there's a drift. Uh, a drift, again, configuration is different in the database than you're expecting. And in this case, so we can see very clearly, it says uh, production is different than uh, the label that you're expecting it to, to see. And of course, you have a report. You can get this over an email saying, uh, you know, production, 
uh, an object procedure, the, the, the micro procedure has changed. It, it doesn't hold what you think it, it should hold. And this is what the master expected or what you expected. It should have a select one, as you see here, uh, but it holds, it has select two. That's what's actually in the database. Now, if you think about it, uh, this does not happen uh, when you do code development anymore. It used to happen like 20, 30 years ago. You know, people going directly to a database and, and making changes. Unfortunately for the database, it's, it's still something that people practice. And a lot of the companies I talk to have this challenge. This is why the 70 plus percent of, of uh like uh, failures attributed to uh, uh, configuration drift. And actually this is uh, what God was referring to as, 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 as a big problem to, to solve. So what the investor does here, it actually identifies this uh, 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 drift, this potential risk. It may be nothing. It may be something that you can easily override, but you have the chance to look at it. And of course, what you don't want to do is override somebody else's uh, bug fix. Uh, because, you know, uh, it may like fail, your release may fail, that's not nice, you know, everybody would be in panic and running, hopefully not on, on weekend, that's never nice. But I think even a worse situation is where you override something and you don't even notice or know that you created damage. And, and, and for the database, it's very easy to, to do, like if you run uh, and, and, and an alter command or create or replace command, it doesn't generate an error. You know, if, if you replace, if you override something and that something is different than you expected, you still overridden it. And, and, and that means that you may have created damage and not even know that. So what the MSO does here, it lets you identify in advance that something uh, went wrong. Okay. So by the time we were talking here, this was uh, already uh, deployed, so JIRA 2, but JIRA 2, well, it's not what we wanted. Uh, it moved automatically to NQA, but let's let's take it back, okay? We're not happy with it. It's not functioning well. We need to remove that. And, and what's going to happen now is that the master is actually going to trigger a downgrade process that would uh, reverse uh, the environment, like in the re reverse or first, uh, like peel it up from from here and then from there, like in the reverse, reverse order that it was introduced, and uh, let's uh, see it working in a few seconds. So uh, everything that we did uh, uh, was documented. So if I'm looking at that uh, uh, deployed release, uh, we know like uh, who's the person uh, that deployed it at what time, what what's the server feedback. So we have like uh, an audit. This is an audit of a specific environment, like maybe it's best for production, and especially if I'm trying to look at it from an inventory perspective. So what do I have in production? I have version 7, version 8, version 9, because of these business reasons. So that the code is correlated with the actual um, requirement. And it was introduced by this person at that time. Okay, so very easy to understand. We have different reports like, uh, who created the code? Uh, when was it deployed? By who? So you have great accountability, accountability uh, different processes, different uh, 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 ways to introduce changes. We can see uh, this one was already uh, downgraded to Jira 1. This one is going to uh, go now. I can open up and, and, and see this actually uh, running. So we could actually follow this in real time. Of course, all the feedback that goes into uh, uh, your uh, CI, if that's uh, urban code, uh, GitLab, etc., all of this would be uh, available in. Uh, why do I have a virus? Whatever. Okay, never mind. Um, so, um, come on. So this is actually running in 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 real time. Uh, creating the labels, documenting everything, and and uh, reversing all of my changes, and of course saving the information of what was done. And if I'm uh, looking at this, it's just wrapping up, documenting the changes. And if I'm going in, I can see that uh, today I did an upgrade and a, a rollback, and it's documented and it's attributed to me. So everything is audited. Everything is um, is uh, 
documented in, in, in a very auditable way. So uh, where this person came from, what credentials did they use? Like, what did you actually do in the database? What do you mean you didn't drop a table? It says that you dropped the table. So, okay, it's very clear what's happening. Uh, everything that we do is uh, measured. Uh, this information can be uh, consumed from other places if you're looking uh, to, to uh, pull this from, from Velocity, from uh, BI platforms or whatever. Uh, so, you know, all the classic uh, scorecards, uh, uh, deployment frequency, failure frequency, lead time, et cetera, et cetera. And maybe one of the more important things is that if we're going to that, uh, where's the pipeline? Never mind, let's open up another one. If you're going to that pipeline, uh, you essentially uh, defined to DB Maestro uh, what are the different uh, environments and essentially how to connect to each one of them. So this puts you in a very interesting position. I, I talked about a lot of things. I didn't talk about security, and, and here's uh, how it, it, it plugs in. So first of all, obviously, uh, from a policy perspective, uh, being able to make sure that you don't do any uh, uh, like bad coding and like executing things in, in that would dynamically change in runtime that can be misused or doing grunts that are not good. This is obvious, okay? But the master also gives you the ability to make sure that you can work based on your role. So this is role-based security for your database. Uh, instead of having uh, login credentials, for your database, login credentials to your environment and, and having to maybe share or not share that dedicated or generic uh, user and password, what DMSO would do is actually connect on your behalf using a, a, a pre-designed or a pre-defined uh, user. That means that if you need to deploy something to, to QA, that may be your role, but it doesn't mean you need to do other stuff in QA. And we can easily bridge this by creating role-based security. So how does that work? You also can uh, create a role. Let's say uh, I want to do some separation of duties. So uh, this would be dev team A. Okay, an easy example. So dev team A can access only these projects. So you remember, we have a lot of uh, projects. So maybe I need to know about all uh, some of them, maybe not all of them, but it doesn't mean I can deploy to all of them. So I would have credentials to specific projects. And in these projects, I could have the role to do self-service, but it doesn't mean I have service, self-service all the way. So maybe we want to practice, uh, if you remember uh, from the beginning, I said balancing the load between uh, uh, developers and, 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 and database people. So maybe instead of uh, bombarding database people with changes, I would get uh, like the permission or the service to deploy changes to development and integration, or maybe even QA, you know, depending on your process. Uh, if I have something repeatable that worked, then the ops team or DBA team or whoever could, say, could be saying, okay, uh, we are not introducing changes to these environments, but we definitely deploy it further once it's succeeded. So as easy as that, as, as that, we have separation of duties. So being able to uh, create these roles to make sure that the passwords are not available to, to the actual user, yet they can do whatever they need and whatever they, they should be doing, this creates a lot of flexibility. This is preventing a password sprawl. This is preventing a lot of the headaches uh, uh, surrounding database uh, password management. Because if you think about it, if the password is either encrypted DB master or externally, we, we also support like uh, 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 password vaults. You may have a process that you s recycle passwords every three weeks and nobody knows about it, okay? So whenever someone wants to like get the password from the vault, he would sign in, he would get like documented and he would do whatever he needs to do, but password would keep changing while the developer, the DBA, and DB Maestro would not know what is the password to the database. So you can get to a very, very secured process, uh, which of course is very important when 
I don't know, maybe part of this uh, our pipeline is on-prem and part of it is on cloud, and you really need to secure that process and make sure that nobody has access that you uh, wouldn't want them to have. So uh, what did I talk about today? So uh, I mentioned uh, source control, being able to document changes, to streamline these changes into your GitLab, your Git, your uh, uh, different uh, 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 repos. Once changes are uh, introduced, the NSO will help you generate uh, the change script. Uh, either if the master generated the change script or you're getting it elsewhere, like from a subcontractor, from another team, over email, if someone hand, hand codes it, it's perfectly fine. It would go into a CI process. That CI process would uh, deliver, uh, through your definition of a pipeline, would deliver uh, policy checks, which is static code analysis, uh, would deliver runtime checks, which is dynamic code analysis. And then when you're uh, happy uh, with the results, it would also deploy changes while documenting everything. Uh, who did it? When did they do it? What did it get to? Uh, how far did you reach? Did you, like, why did you introduce this change? Oh, because of uh, uh, this Jira ticket, because of that Jira ticket to this environment by this person. So everything is audited and everything is set up to be uh, completely secured. Uh, and with that, let me uh, jump back into my presentation. Okay, so that was a demo. I hope you find it uh, interesting. Um, to uh, wrap up, um, by the way, if you have questions, please uh, uh, drop them in, in the chat uh, chat box. So essentially, uh, looking at uh, different, let's call it success stories, and, and how uh, different companies actually leveraged uh, the Maestro uh, to their uh, agile and, and automated uh, perspective. Uh, one company, uh, it was a really nice process that, that I had a chance to follow from the very first inception and, and first meeting to uh, a few years later when it's fully automated. They started by having uh, DBA teams coming over in the weekend, having like a high heap of, of, I don't know, 100 plus scripts and having to manually go uh, through the scripts, uh, connect to the server, run the script, check the box on the Excel file or whatever. A very tedious uh, 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 process, prone to errors. You know, did you skip something? Did you miss it? Did you run it by the order that you needed? Too many files, too many challenges. So, they, and they had a release like that every three weeks. Like, about three years later, they are at 2,400 releases a month, fully automated, no uh, like no intervention. Uh, developers are initiating changes. Everything is flowing uh, forward and, and obviously great for productivity, great for time to market, great for the bottom line of the business. Uh, second story I want to mention, uh, another uh, bank uh, used to work around four hours on creating a release. Why? Because of many development team, they have like, it's not that huge, like a hundred plus developers, but on 60 plus uh, projects, like juggling all the time. So what does that release need to, to be? And, and what is the scope? Uh, four hours per release. Today they're running 60 a day. Uh, again, fully automated. Another story not here on this uh, uh, list, but I actually uh, want to share this as well. Another uh, uh, great customer of ours uh, used to have a big team of, of DBAs investing more than 50% of their time doing code review. They're using our policies to just automate the whole process and uh, they were freed to do other stuff, other things. Instead of uh, uh, reading code and between us, nobody's listening. It's just statistical. It's, it's, it's a chance if you're going to hit uh, the issue or not. So that once that is becoming fully automated, it's becoming 
also uh, uh, 100 percent uh, coverage of, of the code. Last one I want to talk about very close to the demo I've, I've shown today that started uh, that's actually a, an insurance company. It started by uh, having that uh, 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 that company having a process where when a developer wanted something, he would open up a ticket that would go to his team leader, to the project manager, to the different like team of uh, 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 managing uh, the, the DBAs down to the DBA. He would do the stuff, bubble up the process and back. That used to take overall in, in, in average six days for something to uh, start be done and, and, and concluded. Today, this process takes 15 minutes. So when talking about productivity, when talking about being able to crank up that uh, uh, speed, but not at the expense of risk or compliance or security, uh, this is the value that can be achieved um, with the Master. And with that, I would... Uh, like to have your questions and uh, be happy to answer them. I hope you find that uh, interesting and uh, looking forward uh, to, to doing what you have. Please use the chat uh, for anything. Hey, Yaniv, it's Cosmo. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Perfect. I'm having audio problems here, so I'm going to go video list for the second year. Um, but I do have a couple questions for you. So you mentioned you mentioned two two products, and I'm going to ask you how how we integrate with both. So the first one you you mentioned was GitLab. So how does the Maestro integrate with GitLab? Okay, perfect. So first of all, uh, I, I showed like snippets of 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 GitLab. Essentially. Um, uh, what uh, like the integration is essentially very simple. Uh, Dimastro uh, is is uh, offering a, an agent. So at the end of the day, you don't want like a, a, a cloud solution connecting to your on-prem database. That's obviously a security no-no. So uh, Dimastro, as from an architecture perspective, would be pulling uh, uh, for changes. So when you trigger uh, a GitLab action, this is. Uh, essentially uh, being registered, uh, the agent would pull the changes and again, based on the instructions from GitLab, do the different uh, uh, things that we saw, either uh, doing the CI, doing the CD, uh, providing information. Uh, the feedback itself, as you saw, uh, is uh, pushed back into GitLab. So at the end of the day, it's, it's mostly transparent. W what you would see is like you just added additional functionality to GitLab, and uh, with that, see like the full history of, of, of your CI processes, the full history of your CD processes, and obviously because you're doing this in GitLab, you would see uh, the code, the contributors, the like the pipeline itself, everything in one place. So, in uh, a well successful implementation, you would only see GitLab. The user would be completely behind the scenes and you don't even need to open up uh, the UI. I know that I showed UI today, but it's just a way to, to like, show the options and the, the, the availability of, of different functionalities. But uh, when it's implemented successfully, uh, the master would, would just uh, disappear behind uh, the orchestrator, in this case, uh, GitLab. I hope that answered the question. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Yaniv. So again, a little bit of a question, but an interlude to a commercial for the next sessions that we'll be having is around urban code. So we'll have a session on urban code velocity and then the, the urban code deploy tomorrow. But my question to you is, is, is there a plugin for urban code from DB Maestro? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. There's, there's a plugin. So uh, uh, if if the person who, who wrote the question uh, would like to have like a, a pre-recorded demo of how that looks. It's it's also available so they can contact us uh, maybe in the office hours or, or so. And um, the plugin would just uh, create that uh, transparent connection uh, between Urban Code and, and DMS. So, so 
at the end of the day, you would draw your uh, a pipeline in urban code and DMSO would be activated as a result. So again, very, uh, very transparent once you set it up uh, at the beginning. Perfect. Okay, last question for you. So you, you talked about security. Can you go into a little bit more detail on how it actually works? Uh, you're breaking up, but I heard you asking about uh, our security. So uh, from a security perspective, there's like um, the, the the process and how it works is essentially based on roles. So what the MSO would do, it would identify uh, the user uh, which is authenticated. It's either authenticated through a single sign-on or uh, if you log in through your computer uh, based on Active Directory or LDAP. So the MSO would know who you are uh, based on that user, it would see, uh, uh, like, if you're part of uh, this group or that group, and group association would provide you the role in the investor. So uh, your uh, group in Active Directory or LDAP or, or like, the association of, of the different organizations uh, through their single sign-on would give you just, like, the, your role. But in the investor, the role would be assigned to uh, a project, to your capabilities, etc. So in the investor, you would just manage what that role means. But because it's connected to the user itself, and, and that bridge is done by the investor, it means that if a user moves from one project to another project, and all you do is, is you know you, you change the company uh, directory, he would be revoked of everything that he doesn't need anymore and would automatically have all the, the new credentials. This is important. I, I think one of the biggest problems on, on maybe even not just small, but definitely on, on, on larger uh, organizations is when you have uh, a person starting in a project, uh, he gets the credentials that he needs, then he maybe a year later or two years later, he moves to another project gets more credentials, and nobody remembers to go back and, 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 and revoke access that he may not need anymore. And what happens, like, with a lot of people and a lot of projects and, and, and movements, like, you know, we know that can happen, you end up having uh, too many people with access to too many things they don't need, and that is a problem, not because we don't trust our people, but because... It can be misused. It, it, this is something that, you know, if, if somebody uh, from the outside wants to somehow get you to, to, to click something and he's recording your, your, your keystrokes, now instead of having access to one project or not even that, because, you know, if you use DMSO, you would not even type any passwords. DMSO would recognize them. But uh, instead of having access to everything, you would have access to nothing. So... Being able to, to tie everything in, so to tie the, uh, the organizational strict uh, identification, like uh, directories and, 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 and single sign-on and, so, and such, uh, with a strong password management, either encrypted in your maestro or in an external vault. And based on that, providing and cross-referencing a role, that means you don't have like a direct user password connection kind of a thing that is creating let's say an air gap between the user and the database and that air gap is uh, uh what's making this uh, so secure awesome thanks you need and thank you for a great presentation i know i learned a lot and hopefully our audience learned a few things as well um we're, we're hitting up to the hour now or at least the, the end of this session but as Yaniv had mentioned, he'll be joining us for uh, office hours at 2.30 Eastern, so in about an hour and 10 minutes from now. So if you can join us, please feel free to do so. We'd love to have a conversation with you and talk about some of the topics that are near and dear to your heart. Um, by now, most of you know the drill. There's a poll in the chat to provide feedback on the session. We're always looking to get better and improve every session, um, as well as please join the IBM communities. And uh, of course, select your next session and enjoy your time with us thanks a lot and we'll talk to you soon have a great day it was a pleasure bye-bye